Hello and welcome along to episode 80 of the All Things Leeds podcast. Uh, I'm Ed McIntyre and joining me as always is uh, Charles Foster. Charles, hello. Hi, Matt. How are you doing? I'm uh, very well. How are you? Yeah, I'm not too bad. <laughs> you know, Good. despite Good. the results recently, I'm not too bad. <laughs> Uh, get, getting uh, very close to Christmas, 10 days until Christmas now, which is, uh, you're you all in the Christmas spirit, you're excited? I'm excited for drinking a load and eating my body weight and Christmas dinner, but <laughs> <laughs> that's about it. Yeah, me too, me too. Uh, we're not dead as well, we're not dead, we, po- we probably should just, just mention that, we are we are still alive, uh, we, we haven't recorded for, for quite a while, uh, I basically least, just took a on the other side. <laughs> I basically just took a big uh, break from like social media, from everything, uh, and it it's done a world of good for my uh, mental state, really. I um, mean, also, I've been, you know, got a new background, been uh, busy moving, so that's taken up quite a lot of time. I haven't had a desk space to work with uh, for a number of weeks. So, um, we know we're back now. We're back now doing a podcast, weekly podcast, and we're going to be back later on in the week uh, to look ahead to the uh, Man United game at the weekend. So, that should be good. Uh, but we've got loads coming up uh, in this episode, though. Uh, we will, of course, look back on that 2 uh, 1 defeat uh, at home to West Ham. Uh, from last Friday night, uh, we'll look at how the Leeds United and 23s uh, and women uh, have got on uh, recently. We've got plenty of news to catch up on uh, as well before we look ahead to Leeds United's next game, which sees them take on Newcastle United at Ellen Road on Wednesday night. Loads coming up here on the All Things Leeds podcast. So let's start by reflecting on uh, last Friday night's uh, 2-1 defeat to West Ham at Ellen Road's. Uh, Charles, if you were to describe this game in one word, what would it be? Frustrating. <laughs> Why? Um, because of the the weaknesses that we've we've known about for a long time, attacking and defending set pieces, being a little bit too open, kind of gifting people chances we don't need to by conceding silly free kicks and things like that. The, the, all these weaknesses were kind of compounded in this game. They were evident in the Chelsea game as well, but it seems like every time we can see the set piece at the moment, it feels like it's going to go in the back of the net, <laughs> inevitably. Um, yeah. Obviously, Chelsea scored off a um, set piece. West Ham have scored two against us. I think it's um, is it well over 20% of the goals we've conceded under Bielsa are set piece related, so sorry, well over 20%. So, um, yeah, it's, it's very annoying. <laughs> I mean, Especially the amount of silly free kicks we were giving away, the, the just the daft ones, you know, 25, 30 yards from goal, at really easy, easily crossable positions, um, leaving Ben Rama able to wreak havoc down the centre of the pitch and causing problems every time he got on the ball. It was just, it was sloppy. It was frustrating, as I said. The yeah. one word review, frustrating. It was frustrating. Yeah, it definitely was frustrating. I share the same worry. Every time we, we conceded the corner or set piece, I was, you know, I, I was I was so nervous because we're so shaky at set pieces. We've been shaky all, you know, for, for many years, really, at set pieces, despite, you know, having the likes of Pontus Janssen and stuff. You know, they, he, he you know, he did a good job and, you know, Robin Cox done good, but we're still really shaky. You know, the team's still very small. You know, apart from having, you know, the odd one, you know, six foot odd player, you know, we have a very short team compared to other teams. And West Ham, I was on the uh, Hammers chat, uh, watch along live stream of the weekend. And I was saying to them, look, you, you guys, you've got tall players, you know, a hell of a centre forward is six foot two. Uh, you know, you know, the, the defensive players, they're, you know, all around six foot three, six foot four, you know, they're a very tall team. And I was saying to them, look, set pieces, they, they could cost us here. And, and they did, they did cost us here. And yeah, very poor on Friday night. And as you say, making a lot of mistakes, you know, giving the ball away really easily and then conceding, you know, sloppy free kicks and, and set pieces, just, you know, just don't, you know, if you don't concede those sloppy free kicks and set pieces, then, you know, we should be fine. But, um, but I, it was just, yeah, really frustrating. We weren't at our best at all on Friday night, really weren't at our best at all. And it, yeah, it was very, very poor. We were, of course, without defensive duo, uh, Robin Cock and uh, Diego Juventus, though. Uh, due to injury, we'll get onto those injuries a little bit later on uh, in the show. Uh, so it was a back four with Stuart Dallas, Luke Kalin, uh, Liam Cooper, and uh, Alioski. Uh, Charles, do you feel as though we missed having the options of Robin Cock and Diego Juventus? I mean, I don't think we've seen enough of Juventus yet to make an accurate judgment on whether or not we're missing him. Um, I'd say we are probably missing uh, Robin Cock in the in the back line because I think it just 
just keep things, you know, not disjointed with alien out of position and things like that. And I also feel that being able to keep Stuart Dallas at left back because Alioski got torn apart defensively in that first half really badly. In fact, all down the left hand side were poor. Uh, Jack Harrison's obviously made the mistake for the for their first goal by giving away a, a needless corner by not being strong enough to stay on his feet. Um, so, yeah, there was a lot of concerns um, to do with that. But, yeah, I think we did miss the general defensive partnership that we had in the middle of the defence. Although, even when we've had a bit of full strength, we've been conceding too many sloppy goals. Yeah. Yeah, we uh, we uh, very much have. Yeah, I, I do certainly think that we missed, you know, Robin Cock. He's, you know, he's, he's kind of split opinion amongst Leeds United fans, really. Some think he's really good, some think he's, he's really poor. But I, I think he's, he's overall, you know, quite a good player. He's improved uh, as the season uh, has gone on. And uh, yeah, we really did miss his presence really there. And, you know, as you say, you know, having to mix up the defence again, you know, taking Luke Kaling out of right back, which I think, you know, he's, one of the best right backs in the league, I'd say. He's a very good right back, is uh, Luke Kalen. Very good at, you know, bombing forward. And when he has to go into centre back, and then Stuart Dallas at right back, and Alioski at left back, who is, you know, n- not great, Alioski. You know, he's a fantastic player to have, but I don't think he's quite good enough for the Premier League just yet. Um, but yeah, it, it was, yeah, very annoying to, to have uh, Bobby Cock um, out. But, you know, Luke Kalen, I feel, does still did, you know, quite all right. Stuart Dallas is always pretty good. But Alioski, for you, Charles, what are your thoughts on him in the Premier League? He's all right as a kind of havoc impact sub, you know, in the 80th minute when you want to just, you know, not regain a bit of control, but, you know, disrupt the play, you know, bring him on, cause a bit, cause a bit of mayhem and can try and unsettle the team if, if we're on the back foot a little bit. But he can't be a starting left back. He, he just isn't defensively strong enough. He was, he was, he was getting torn apart down down our left hand side and and down their right and I felt that we were just giving the ball away too cheaply and the the defence weren't pressing well enough either when we lost the ball they were just retreating and retreating and retreating and letting players like Ben Rama and thankfully I had Haller on the pitch who I thought was pretty dreadful all game to be honest um, yeah um, but yeah Ben Rama was excellent all game it, it felt like he was going to score every, every single time he got the ball Ben Rama so he was he was definitely their danger man. Yeah. But yeah, yeah he was so. he, Alioski was just getting torn apart. And I felt that the subs at half time were the right decision, but they still didn't get the you know, the desired outcome. Yeah. Yeah, I, I agree. You know, I don't think Alioski, you know, he's a fantastic player to have and as you say, an impact sub, but yeah, starting at left back, you know, probably not, you know, not the best option really uh there but no yeah ben rama he, he was good for west ham Harlow, though he was really poor he was shocking i, I thought was uh was Harlow. and we, we did well aerially uh against Harlow in open play which i felt was quite weird at set pieces we were poor but you know in open play aerially we, we were quite good with the aerial duels on the on a Harlow. Um, it, it was a it was it was a funny player to watch all game because what he'd do would be blatantly foul somebody and then yeah. play it off like it was not remotely his fault. Like it, there was one where he did it on Phillips, where Phillips basically tackled him, got back up, took the ball, and Haller just blatantly fouled him from behind, and then stood up, and had his hands up in the air, like, "Oh, what you what you're about? Never a foul." Yeah. It's like you've just sacked him. He just him kicked players all game. He, he, he just he, kicked players he kicked down players, all game. He kicked players all, all game, and then was amazed that the referee <laughs> decided to give fouls for it. It was <laughs> it was baffling to watch. Yeah, it certainly was. Um, but the Leeds lineup, though. So what Vigo started first start he's had in uh, in quite a while, uh, which I thought was was quite good to see. Of course, aligned with uh, Rafinha at uh, right mid. Uh, what did you make of uh, Vigo's performance on Friday? It was okay. I felt that it, we didn't really get him on the ball enough. We didn't get up the pitch enough, and we we didn't create enough options when we were going forward. And we did get the ball. There weren't enough positive runs. Or enough movement to mean to mean we could actually create decent chances. He's actually probably his best chance of the game came in um, added time at the end of the second half. Um, as, uh, they the cross in from the from the right where he yeah, did it straight at Fabianski. Um, that was a, that was an excellent chance to steal a completely undeserved point. <laughs> but the um, yeah, he was all right. Everyone was just average. It was a very, very average game for yeah. every Leeds United player. There was no one who shined. There was no one who was particularly brilliant. It was average. 
Yeah, I, I, I'd i say it was quite grim, to be fair. It was, you know, a horrible night, rainy night, and uh, yeah, an average performance really from Leeds United. And Rodrigo, you know, he had a couple of decent chances in, in that, you know, that first half, especially cashing my back to when, you know, just shot straight at Fabianski into the fans with hands when he was about five yards out. Probably should have done better there. Feels though Rodrigo could have easily gotten the score sheet, but yeah, just didn't. And do you, do you think maybe as well the fact that we're not scoring enough is you know, a, a big issue as well, uh, not just set pieces. Yeah, because I feel like earlier in the season, we were efficient enough where most chances we were getting, we were banging in the back of the net. You think about the four threes against Liverpool and Fulham. Um, we, we Every time we got a chance, we were scoring it. Um, the Obviously, the Villa game as well, we, we got our chances and we put them away. When we, now that we've become slightly less efficient in recent weeks, the stupid goals we're conceding, rather than being, you know, like, annoying consolations like the ones you know we conceded later on in the Fulham game where it was just it was a bit irritating but it was all right because we were winning anyway they are now doing as massive damage because we're not doing the business at the other end of the pitch it's become an even more pressing of an issue to figure out why defensively we are conceding so many terrible goals yeah I mean I don't mind I don't mind conceding those ones where I say I don't mind I don't like I never like conceding the goal but you know, like the one the Salah scored against is the first game of the season where he just, you know, banged it top corner, absolutely unsavable. And you think, oh, like the the Eze free kick in the Palace game where the uh, he, he just banged it top corner and there's nothing anybody could do about it. And you think, well, their kind of world is so I don't mind as much conceding them. But when you're conceding like, you know, free headers from set pieces and terrible penalties and tappings and not tracking runs and not pressing people properly on the edge of the box. That's that's where I get a little bit frustrated. And I say a little bit frustrated. I get extremely frustrated watching us. Yeah, yeah. We, we are conceding too many sloppy goals recently, but then also not scoring enough. And I think at the start of the season, we were just outscoring teams. But now we, we're struggling to score and we're, sim- yeah, we're simply not scoring enough and we're not outscoring teams anymore. And it is quite quite worrying, really. And it's both ends of a pitch that we need to quite work on. You know, we need work on. You know, we need work on, you know, set pieces defensively. But then also, you know, putting away chances because we create 50-odd chances a game. You know, we create so many chances per game, but we're just not just not scoring enough at the moment. And it is quite worrying. We, of course, did score in this game, though. We got off to a great start in this game. Uh, going 1-0 ahead after just six minutes. Uh, Matash clicks going from the penalty spot, not an open play though. Uh, so yeah, still more penalty though. Liam Cooper playing through uh, Bamford, lovely ball through to Bamford, uh, one on one straight away. And uh, Fabianski uh, brought Bamford down and picked up a yellow card for his troubles. Um, and you know, it was quite a nice build up, wasn't it? Charles to win that penalty, yeah, it was, was, it was good build up. And I was, I was pleased to see that we'd uh that we got through such a great start, but in the, end, the penalty we actually took was awful. Um, the initial <laughs> one, uh, obviously yeah. it was a retake, which Clicky eventually scored, but the first one was dreadful. Uh, and we got very fortunate that VAR is as, um, let's just say, you know, random as it is, as, you know, as ludicrous as it is. I mean, would you say that it's a fault with VAR, though? A lot of people were saying, you know, VAR, get get rid of it, you know, it's ruining the game and you know, whatnot, all that argument again. But I, for me, it wasn't a problem with VAR because the rule is there. The rule's been in place, in place for so many years. There's just not been the technology to actually, you know, find goalkeepers coming off their line. But, you know, the rule's there. The goalkeeper cannot move off of their goal line. And VAR was just doing its job, I felt. It was catching players, breaking the rules. And, you know, pull it back and, and get the penalty retaken. I don't think it's a flaw with VAR. I think it's a flaw with the rules in itself. I think that there needs to be a bit of leeway. You know, the referees have got spray, maybe, you know, spray spray uh, a line down, you know, two you know two yards from the goal line. Give the goalkeeper a little bit more place to move. Otherwise, you know, it's going to be impossible for goalkeepers to save penalties now. Well, that's, the thing. That's, that that, that's, my, that's my opinion. If you're asking goalkeepers to stay, you know, on the line at all times, saving pens is... Very unlikely. The yeah. reason so many um, goalkeepers have saved penalties in the past is because they've and c- correctly anticipated which way they're going to go and been off the line and over in time to you know to pour it away. The um, I just I don't I don't I don't like VAR. And to be honest, when I saw that we we were we'd retaken it and scored, I actually just laughed because I thought how many times in the championship were one of them either gone would one of them either have gone against us or gone for us. You think about how many dodgy penalty decisions, you know, goalkeepers been off lines and things, and you just think 
I don't like this this measurements and rulers based computer yeah. approach to football. It really gets on my nerves, to be honest with you. Yeah, I mean, for, for me, I don't mind VR. I think it is good to just have it there, you know, and you, you can, you know, call the clear off sides that, you know, linesmen have missed and, you know, clear fouls that, you know, referees have missed. And I think it's good there. But when it's get, getting to fine margins like this, then it is quite frustrating. But now, as I say, you know, the rules there, I, I think it is a flaw in the rules. I don't. I think that rule needs to be altered a little bit and give goalkeepers a better chance. Because even if they're going one yard off their goal line, the attackers, you know, the striker, the person taking the penalty still has the advantage. They're getting a free hit 12 yards from goal, you know, anywhere. They've only got the key goalkeeper to beat, so they've still got the big advantage. You know, I, I think just give the goalkeepers a, a bit of chance. Uh, what what would be the solution for you here? Would it be just to scrap the yard or change the rules? I would, I would put a time limit on how long VAR got to make a decision. It'd be none of this like three minutes looking at people's kneecaps and elbows and sh- t-shirt <laughs> lines. I would scrap all that crap. The, uh, the the t-shirt line especially because you, they're not even following their own rules. That's the annoying thing about the t-shirt. I know this is not relevant to the game that we that we've just played, but uh, the t-shirt one for you know Bamford against Palace a few weeks ago where it's <laughs> he got marked offside because of his t-shirt line. If you score a goal with that part of your, you know, realistically it's a part of your arm. If you score a goal with your t-shirt line, that that is going to be disallowed, isn't it? So why is it designated offside when you're if you score a goal with a part of your body that's not your arm, but your arm is offside? That makes no sense whatsoever. So that yeah. can go immediately. <laughs> um, yeah, I'd also put the time limit on. I'd also, yeah, none of this. This, this, like, just, just the, how long it takes, and I would also have the ability for referees, you know, to, to be constantly in contact with VAR. They should, VAR referees should be in the ear of referees at all times, pointing stuff out. Like, you should go look at this incident immediately, not the referees deciding to go look at an incident and then asking the VAR people to have a look as well. <laughs> yeah, Did you see yeah, so many, I, so many I, incidents. I agree. It, it, there was one in one in the West Ham game. I think it was it was it Og Bonner basically was playing basketball in his own box, scooping the ball up under his arm. Did you see that bit? Yep. And um, that's exactly the kind of thing where there should be a, someone at VAR should be going to the referee. You need to come have a look at this. Not the referee going. Well, I didn't see anything there. And the, and, the, and VAR referee is going. Well, if the referee in the pitch didn't see it, I'm not going to take a look at the incident. It's just so stupid. Yeah, not that. We'll be going for that Bonner incident. Do you think that was a penalty? Do you think that should have been given handball? Yes, absolutely. People go, oh yeah, it hits him in the in the side of the arm, and it's not in a natural position. When it initially hits him, it's not in a natural position. But then he he scoops his arm down round the ball to take it away from Bamford. It literally yeah. rolls. It it hits kind of the top of his wrist, like there. Trying to get the camera frame like that, it hits the top of his <laughs> as he's curbing his arm. He curves it away from Bamford. Yeah, sorry, I, know, I wasn't expecting this to be as you know as bloody physical comedy as it is, but you know, <laughs> the top of the, the top of the wrist, you know, he scoops it away from Bamford's feet. So, why that isn't given? Yeah, I mean, I uh, think it's a tough one to call. I, I think it looks like he's you know falling over quite a bit and trying to get his balance back. I, I think it's a hard one to call. I think it would have been. Harsh, and if it was given against us, I, I don't think we'd have been too happy. But you know, the ball definitely touched his touched his hand, and yeah, I think in this day and age, with you know what handballs are given for, uh, given against now, yeah, I, I he, do make, probably he think makes that. a positive movement. He makes a positive movement towards the ball with his arm and touches mm. it. That for me is handball. Yeah, 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 I, yeah. I, I think I'd agree with that. That obviously came at the uh, at the end of that uh, first half. Uh, West Ham obviously equalised uh, after 25 minutes. They started going into the game after we had gone one 0 ahead, and yeah, equalised on 25 minutes. Thomas Suchek uh, heading in uh, from a corner. Uh, Mesia did get hands to it, but not enough to to keep the ball out. Uh, could we have done more to prevent this goal, Charles? Could Mesia have done better? Mesia and Stuart Dallas, uh, particularly Dallas, fails to track the run whatsoever. Doesn't jump. Doesn't even attempt it. Mesia. Re- reacts far too late. Uh, doesn't he, he should be saving that? It's pretty much just to the just to the left of him. All he has to do is put his arm out a bit more, 
commit a bit more and not have his feet as planted and he, he's saving that. Um, but yeah, the how easy players get a run on us. It happened, they, they basically scored the same goal twice. It was just a back post, you know, round the yeah. back of the, um, a back post run for both for both yeah. goals off on a set piece and no one tracked them. No one's getting, no one's getting anything in the air. Cooper's at fault for the second one for, for, for just not beating him in the air. I know you, they've got tall players and I know our team is not tall, but come on. They scored the, <laughs> You can't allow a team to score the same goal twice yeah. in one game. Yeah, it was very poor defensively. And I think also highlights again, you know, Elon Meslier, fantastic goalkeeper. You know, I think Elon Meslier is wonderful. But at set pieces, I think his reaction in and, you know, his positioning, I think, can can be improved. Just everything about us defending set pieces needs to be worked on because it really, really is poor. Uh, but yeah, one all at half time. Of course, Click scoring that penalty to get his, uh, his third goal of the season. Uh, but yeah, one all at half time. Shackleton and Costa came on for Harrison and Elioski. Uh, you already said that you felt as though the subs were, were right, but I feel as though Shackleton, you know, Shackleton, I can see why he brought him on, but Costa over Perveda, you know, Perveda's been excellent over the past few weeks. I feel as though Perveda probably should have come on. I know, but Perveda did eventually come on and we didn't. Didn't really. Did he not? That one in the game? No, Taylor Roberts came on. Oh, I'm thinking of the. I'm thinking of the Chelsea game. Sorry, ignore me. Uh, yeah, Tyler Roberts did come on. I'm thinking of the Chelsea game. He did come, prevented him coming to the Chelsea game. Yeah. Um, I don't know if Costa hasn't been impressive in recent weeks, but... No, he hasn't. Nobody really, apart from Rafinha, has been impressive going forward in recent weeks. I mean, obviously, Bamford's keeping up with his... Uh, he's still scoring. He's, 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 quite, he's... I thought Bamford was actually pretty decent in this game. I thought he was decent, you know, tracking his runs, doing his pressing. I thought he tracked back quite a lot. Yeah, and I thought, obviously, he, 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 won, he, won the, uh, he won the penalty. So he, he basically did his job for the most part. He didn't really get another kind of proper chance during the game, which, you know, you have to like the feet of the rest of the team, really. Um, so, yeah, I, I didn't... With Costa, I, I don't know if I had a brownie one. I, thought, I, I didn't think he had much impact when he came on anyway. I don't think anybody really... That second half was just... I'm trying to find another a kind of word than atrocious. It was just really bad from start yeah, to finish. It was woeful in that second half. We barely did anything, and it's not like West Ham. You know, were were fantastic. They were just they just had to be better than us, and that was quite easy to do because we were yeah we were shocking in that second half, absolutely shocking. And yeah, I, you know, I do think P- Pervader should have gone on. He, he's been fantastic in recent weeks. Costa didn't do much. Shackleton didn't do much. Tyler Roberts, when he came on, I thought, you know, didn't do much either. You know, especially, you know, you've got, you've got Pablo Hernandez on the bench. You know, he usually digs us out of trouble. But instead, he, he brings on, you know, Tyler Roberts, which I feel as though was, was probably, in, you know, a, not another baffling decision, really. I feel as though the substitutions probably weren't, you know, I feel as though it was right to, you know, make subs at half time. But, you know, when you got Pervader and Hernandez there, over Costa and, and Tyler Roberts, you know, feels though they would have been best of options. But no, we were awful in that second half. Didn't deserve anything from it. Did not deserve anything from this game. Of course, West Ham won the game with uh, 10 minutes to, to go. Ogbonna heading in from a free kick. Free header. Liam Cooper just completely lost. Lost his man. And yeah, I mean, set pieces, Charles, we, we've already touched on them. They are a big, big problem, aren't they, set pieces? Well, yeah, <laughs> If I was playing us at the moment, I would literally just say, get in their final third and just wander about till someone fouls you and we'll score. <laughs> yeah. It, that, it, that's it, simply it. If you, if you get a free kick 30 yards from goal or a corner, you've got a very, very good chance of scoring. A very, mm. very good chance. Yeah. At the, it, it, feel, it feels like when we concede a corner at the moment, it's like we're conceding a penalty. That's how it, that's how it feels. Yeah, it feels honestly, like I, I feel that moment. as well. I, I feel that as well. Yeah, it, it really, really does. Yeah, every, every time we concede a set piece, it's just, are they going to score here? Are we going to concede? You know, it's, yeah, the, it, it's not great. And the and the the, free, the actual free kick we conceded was just Costa being lazy with the ball and then badly tackling. And I don't mean badly as in trying to injure, I mean badly tackling. As in, it was just an awful attempt at a tackle. And uh, conceding a completely unnecessary free kick. Which mm. and there was lots of them in the game. There was a lot of really unnecessary free kicks. I seem to spend a lot of the second half just watching us boot people up in the air about thirty yards from goal. 
They must, the players must be aware as well, because Bielsa's uh, been, said it in his press conference, the players must be aware, look, we're very weak defending set pieces. Why yeah. the hell would we... Cons- why the hell would we would we you know try and foul people you know anywhere near the goal? You just mm. tell people to jockey, jockey until we win the ball back, and then get it back up the pitch. Because yeah. putting a foot in at the moment, we're just leading ourselves to into proper trouble. Yeah, yeah, we just need to cut out the the mistakes. You know, uh, cut out conceding sloppy free kicks, and yeah, just just try and limit the set pieces as much as we can. That. And then, you know, instead of giving away 10 set pieces, you know, 10 corners, you know, five free kicks a game, you know, just 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 try to limit them as much as possible and then, you know, see what we can do. What would you say the biggest problem is, though? Set pieces defend- defensively or, you know, scoring? Because we're not, we're, we're quite frankly not scoring enough. Um, The set pieces, I have to say. Yeah. Because if we, just, if we resolve that and resolve the defensive issues, then... The games are going to be a lot. Are going to be so much easier to win because because mm. if we actually resolve our defensive issues from set pieces in that game, I never felt like West Ham were ever going to score from open play, even though they were much better than us and they deserved mm. the win. It didn't feel like they were going to bang one in from from, from open play. Mm. It only felt like we were going to concede from a from a penalty or from a set piece, and we concede yeah. from two set pieces. So if you cut mm. that that out, then we then we win the game undeservedly, but we win the game. The um, I mean, I'm loath to quote Alex Ferguson on a bloody Leeds podcast, but you know, he, he said, uh, you know, a good attack wins your games, a good defense wins your titles, and that's that's true. <laughs> if you can defend yeah. properly, then you, you don't need to score much. So resolving, and if you don't need to score much, then it will, that will take the pressure off the forwards, and hopefully they'll relax a bit more and they'll be get a bit more fluency. So it all ties in. I would I would say. Defend, resolving the defensive problems with set pieces. Yeah. So, what would you do? Bring back Gianni Villa? I mean, that one set piece away, but Burton Albion away. <laughs> That's yeah. Gianni Villa's entire contribution to Leeds United. Um, <laughs> no, I wouldn't do that. I would just, yeah. I would just, all other than the standard kind of fitness stuff and the murder ball stuff, I would literally, I would scrap tactical stuff for this week and uh, and just work on set pieces. <laughs> Because I think, not not permanently. I'm not I'm not you know suggesting something drastic here. But I would just say right now it's our biggest weakness, and you need to work on resolving your biggest weakness. So I would just have the players be defending corners mm. and free kicks all week, mm. uh, repeatedly, until they got it right, and then yeah. obviously do the murder ball stuff on Wednesday. Uh, because you know, plus Newcastle play with two up front, so we're going to have to play with three at the back because that's the way the Bielsa the Bielsa does it. And I I hate us playing three at the back. I think we. We don't play well at the three at the back at all, especially when we've got two of our centre backs injured. So I'm, <laughs> I wonder how we're actually going to line up. It's going to yeah. be strange. Um, yeah, it's definitely going to yeah, be I would, interesting. I would, I would, I would literally, instead of doing all the tactical stuff this week, I would just try and resolve the set piece issues. Just <laughs> do it, do it religiously all week till it's resolved. Yeah, no, I'd I'd probably do the same. But you know, we're not Bielsa. You know, Bielsa. No, no, we'll, 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 we'll obviously not. This, you know. Yeah, we need question we Bielsa. <laughs> I've, I've got absolute faith in him. I've not questioned his methods whatsoever. I just think <laughs> it is it is the most glaring of our weaknesses at the moment, it, and yeah. he, he knows it because he's mentioned it in a, in a press conference. So yeah. I would like to see us spend a bit more time in training on it. Yeah. Yeah, hopefully. Uh, you mentioned that you know West Ham didn't look like scoring in open play, and I think a big reason uh, as to why that was was because of Ilan Messier. Absolutely superb again in this game. Made a number of unbelievable saves, you know, denying Balbrainer's close-range header, Harler's overhead kick from close range as well. You know, uh, Ilan Messier, 20 years old, he's just incredible, isn't he? Yeah, but he's been forced into these positions by... Basically, just the defenders not doing their jobs properly. Yeah. He's, there's, he's there's just a got lot of these. Like, yeah, he really has, and they need to sort themselves out because they've been really poor for weeks now. Mm. We've won one game in our last six. I mean, granted, there are there are certainly three worse teams than us in this league. Certainly, <laughs> I mean, although Fulham got that really surprising point against Liverpool, they're terrible. Uh, Sheffield United uh, looked to be set, trying to set some kind of hilarious new record. Um, 
fighting out with Derby um, over who can be the worst Premier League team of all time. I want to see if they can go. I want. I would love them to finish the season on one point. <laughs> that would be hilarious to me. <laughs> that would be amazing. Yeah, uh, but you know, they'll, they'll pick up a point of somebody eventually. Um, probably another point, I should say. Probably, yeah, probably us. Um, well, probably they'll probably beat Arsenal. <laughs> but yeah, the um, Arsenal look to be worse than us at the moment. I mean, yeah. Burnley up until Burnley up until recently have been pretty dreadful. Um, so the West Brom are pretty awful. So the, there's definitely teams that are worse than us in this league. We just need to get a little bit of form together and sort the defensive mm-hmm. mistakes out. Unfortunately, yeah, yeah. The two, we've got, we, we'll be playing Newcastle with uh, with Callum Wilson up front. He's probably one of the most uh, informed strikers over you know so far this season. And then we're playing obviously Scum away, which is going to be really hard. <laughs> so we've not got the kindest. Imagine no fixtures, kind of. But we've not got the kindest fixture uh, list. Plus, no. set, uh, with Steve, Steve Bruce with, with Newcastle, I guarantee you he'll just be saying what we said earlier: win as many set pieces as possible. <laughs> just, just, just continue yeah. to do it. Get as many corners, force as many saves, because we will score from a corner at some point. <laughs> Yeah, probably start Andy Carroll and just get as many set pieces as possible. Uh, but no, we we definitely do need to pick up some form. That two one loss was you know made it back to back defeats, four losses in six. Uh, that leaves us still in fourteenth place in the Premier League table. They won fourteen points, but we are now just six points above the relegation zone. So, you know, we're in a relegation battle, aren't we? Is it is it time to panic for you? Uh, not yet, not yet. We always knew it was going to be tough, and there's plenty of games to go. I'm not panicking yet. If we get into like March time and we're still on like 20 odd points, then I'm going to be worried. <laughs> or, you know, not March time, you know, I should say, you know, late January, February time, if we're still on like 20 points, I'm going to be worried. Yeah. Um, but, you know, we just need to pick up a couple of results, a couple of wins here and there, and we'll get back into the swing of things. Mm. We need to start that by beat. We need, we need to beat Newcastle, really. Yeah. Get, get yeah, three we'll points on the ball. Game later on in the game, yeah. uh, later on in the uh, in the uh, podcast. But yeah, it, uh, you know, there's there's definitely concerns. You know, set pieces are concerned. The fact that we're not scoring enough is concerns, and we just need to iron those iron those weaknesses out. But you know, at the moment, yeah, I, I'm not panicking. You know, it looks like we are going to be in a relegation battle. Maybe you know, in, in a few weeks' time, but we are still six points above the relegation zone. Yeah, I don't think it's time to panic yet. I think it's where we we probably were expected to be. You know, we're a newly promoted team. We're not gonna, you know, it would be lovely to compete for for Europe, but you know, like, like Wolves did, and you know, Sheffield United did uh, last season in their first season back in the Premier League. But you know, it, it was not. It, it wasn't always going to go like that. You know, I I think expecting us to compete in this division, you know, was you know was you know looking at it through rose tinted glasses. Really, you know, I feel I feel as though we are where. You know, I, I certainly expected Leeds to be in this position. And, you know, I, I'm not too too angry about being 14th. You know, we're, we're mid-table. We're mid-table and quite comfortably in mid-table, I'd say. You know, <laughs> I probably won't be saying this in two weeks' time. We, you know, if we, if we lose a couple more games, it could all change. But, you know, at the moment, we're six points above the relegation zone. It's where I kind of expected us to be. It's our first season back. back. We're not going to compete. I think we will be fine. Our goal is to stay in the division and I think we will be fine. We only have to be better than three other teams in this league and we are. You know, we're better than Sheffield United, I'd say. We're better than Fulham, better than Arsenal. You know, Arsenal are in a relegation battle as well, don't forget. Uh, you know, they're, yeah, they're, they're just... They're, they're still below us. They're below us. Hilariously, they're below us. I don't even know how that yeah. happened. <laughs> yeah, so if you think we're in a relegation battle, then, you know, Arsenal are in a relegation battle as well. So, uh, yeah, I, I think we'll be fine. I think we'll be fine. What about you, Charles? Yeah, well, I, I mean, we were doing our pre-season predictions and I said we'd be lower mid-table and we are lower mid-table. So, as, yeah. as you were saying, this is where we expected to be. Um, I can't say I'm not a little bit disappointed. Not not with where we are, but why we are where we are, if you know what I mean. Mm. Because... I, the way, the way we, we know how well now, we can play. Yeah, we do know how well we can play. We know how how good the players are, but they're not showing it right now. And they need to be they need to show it. Otherwise we're gonna yeah. be in trouble. Yeah. And a quick turnaround uh, is needed. We, of course, move on to Newcastle United on Wednesday night. Uh, we'll look ahead to that game later on in the show. The Leeds United under-23s uh, moved to the top of the PL2 table after coming back from 2-0 down to beat Aston Villa 3-2 at 
at Four Parch on Sunday with goals from Bobby Kamwa, Sam Greenwood, and Tyler Roberts. Uh, Charles, more impressive stuff from uh, Mark Jackson's side. <laughs> cheat codes FC <laughs> playing Pablo Hernandez. In it does feet. feel like cheat codes, doesn't it? You're starting Pablo Hernandez, who's 35 years old, and Tyler Roberts. <laughs> Scoring the winner from a penalty spot, it does feel like cheat codes, doesn't it? <laughs> just feel like, just kind of feel like we're playing FIFA or an amateur. <laughs> it's um, yeah, well, I mean, it is pleasing, and I would like to see a couple of the youth players eventually make it up into the first team and uh, mm. have a few more academy graduates. Um, I can see Tyler Roberts eventually moving on. To be honest with you, um, I know one. we're not. That's not what we're talking. Probably all. I think he'll probably go on loan to a championship team, like a top, yeah. like a top end championship team. So, like a Norwich or like a Bournemouth or somewhere like that. You can see, you could see him doing going to a place like that. Um, but yeah, the the, the team, team in general is impressive. Greenwood's very impressive. Um, yeah, I so mean Sam Greenwood another nice. goal for him uh, in this game. That's six and seven uh, now uh, in this campaign for Sam Greenwood. Uh, surely he, he's not too far off. Featuring for the first team, especially when you look at the fact that we're not scoring enough recently. Surely Sam Greenwood's not too far off being, you know, considered for for a place, you know, on the bench. I wouldn't be surprised if he was to overtake Tyler Roberts eventually in the pecking order and being that kind of backup striker for, for Bamford. I mean, I, I don't, I don't think you can justify taking Bamford out of the team at all. The moment he's in, you know, I think he's like third up top scorer in the league or something stupid. Uh, was he on eight goals already? Um, <laughs> so that's brilliant. So, yeah, I think I, I, I would put you know either him, Greenwood or Joe Gell. That's been impressive as well. So, there's there's a lot of talent in the youth system. I mean, yeah. you were big fans of um, of of Charlie Cresswell as well. Of him eventually making the jump up because he's he's a really quality centre half. So there is a lot of, there is a lot of talent there. Even though we are joking about us uh, putting a bunch of pensioners in the in the under twenty threes to win games, um, th- there is still a lot of a lot of grit and talent there. We just but like the first team, they need to be a little bit more defensively solid. <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. But, you know, there, there is a lot of good players in the 23 side. And as I say, top of the league. And, you know, it's their first season in the PL2. You know, it's a new league. It's a way better league. And, you know, the fact that they're at the top of the table after 10 games is, you know, it's pretty good going. And it's very pleasing to see. Uh, very good stuff. From uh, Mark Jackson's side, uh, the Legion Island 23's next take on Fulham on Monday, the 21st of December at Four Parch. Uh, with a game kicking off at 2 p.m. So make sure to uh, tune in for that one. I'm sure it'll be streamed uh, on social media. Um, and the Leeds United women uh, returned after lockdown in style after coming back from behind three times to beat Stockport 4-3 away from home last Sunday with goals from Olivia Smart, uh, Alia uh, Nolan, uh, Molly Havard and Rebecca Hunt uh, down on her side. And our fourth in Division 1 North uh, and they host Liverpool Feds at 2 p.m. next Sunday. Well, England moved back into a tier system lockdown when the full national lockdown ended at the start of December, uh, with some places in tier three, some in tier two, and some in tier one. Uh, and when that happened, the UK government announced that sporting venues will be allowed uh, to welcome fans back uh, into uh, their grounds, with 4,000 fans being able to attend football matches in tier one locations, uh, 2,000 fans in tier two locations, and none. Uh, in tier three and uh, now we won't go into whether you know we agree or disagree with what the uk government's doing uh, and what ts uh, you know w- what tier certain places should be in uh, but of course you know big cities such as london and liverpool were placed in tier two and you would have seen that you know they they were allowed to welcome fans back into their grounds you know liverpool and share and um liverpool and everton had fans back and you know teams based in london also had fans back uh, over the uh over the past few weeks um, they were allowed to bring back 2,000 fans, of course. Uh, now, Charles, when this was announced at the start of December, uh, what were your initial thoughts You know, on, on fans returning? Um, it was pleasing, but to have, you know, as a football fan in general, I the fans are you know, a big part of why the sport is as good as it is. Huge part, in fact. Um, but I don't want to be one of those people that makes, you know, silly excuses like oh, the grass was too long or you know stuff like that but you know when you've got some teams having fans and some teams not having fans that seems to be an advantage and the whole point of sport is having a level playing field yeah um so i don't know if i'm i'd be hugely in favor of you know some teams having fans and not either everyone should have fans or no one should have fans 
Um, mm. I'm not going to get obviously political with whether or not the uh, the tier system should be applied to different th- things because fundamentally it's a football podcast and uh, those kind of opinions are irrelevant here. But yeah, personally, I I wouldn't have brought back fans unless every team in the Premier League were able to bring back fans. I know it's very frustrating and people will no doubt disagree with me and saying mm. I'm only, I'm only saying that because Leeds can't. I, I still think <laughs> even, even if Leeds could, I'd, I'd I'd still want. I want it to be fair. <laughs> yeah. Most, most, most football fans want it to be fair. So if some teams have got 4,000 fans in cheering the team on and there's no away fans there because the other teams are tier three, that doesn't seem overly fair to me. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, yeah. I'd agree. I, I think it should be a level playing field. Of course, it's a, you know, it's nice seeing fans back in stadiums and not having, you know, that fake crowd noise. You can actually hear real fans, which is, you know, really nice. And I think it's, you know, a big step in the right direction in terms of allowing fans back in. It's a big step in the right right direction of although it's you know it's not brilliant only 2000 fans you know I, I wish it was just a little bit more um but you know it is a small light at the end of this very dark tunnel that we're in right now but um no i do agree i think that it it is perhaps unfair that some clubs you know are allowed to have fans back and some aren't because fans do play a big part in the football as we've seen over the weekend the majority of home sides picked up results because they had you know the fans cheering them on you know the 12th man as they say so yeah, we saw it a couple of weeks ago as well when we played Chelsea away. They had fans there. They were, you know, making all kinds of noises when Levente kept on getting them a ball, putting him off. So, you know, fans do make a big difference. And yeah, I do agree with you. I think that it is a bit unfair, but it's still great seeing fans back. And I do think that it is a step uh, in the right direction. Uh, now, we won't know for definite until later uh, in the week as to whether Leeds will be moved uh, from Tier 3 to Tier 2 uh, or remain in Tier 3. The UK government are uh, reviewing all the tier systems uh, every mm. every two weeks. Uh, so we won't know until later this week whether Leeds uh, will be moved into Tier 2 or not. Uh, but if we were to go into Tier 2, though, of course, 2,000 fans, uh, Leeds fans allowed back at Ellen Road. Uh, it'll be interesting to see how the club works out who's going to get a ticket, won't, won't it, Charles? Because... You know, they have said that they want to keep family and friends together, uh, which might, you know, be a little bit difficult. But, you know, it is going to be interesting to see how the club work it out. You, you'd imagine that scene sticker holders will get priority over everything, which, you know, I don't think many people would argue with. No, I don't think any, anyone could really argue with it. I mean, season, some season ticket holders are paying, you know, 500, 500 quid for their season ticket. And then people buying memberships are paying, you know, 100, 100 quid or less. Um so yeah, the fairest way to do it would just be to ballot the to randomly draw out two thousand if we are to be moving to tier two, two thousand season ticket holders and put them in the put them in the stands. Um I'm not sure how we're gonna figure out who's friends with who and who's family with who. I think that's a bit Yeah. That, that's no, well family you can just look at the, you can just look up the surnames. <laughs> well, so family's well, quite yeah. easy, but friends is probably well, a little yeah, bit. Well, you say that, but not not everyone would some some people are adopting a different name. Some people, are, you know, have stepkids, things like that. So it does. Mm-hmm. There is certain circumstances where people don't have the same name. So I don't know how the friends would be. It'd be more difficult though, because you could just say, you know, <laughs> this 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 guy's my friend. I've been sitting next to him for years. Is uh, but it might not be true. Um, you can say you can say anything as long as you're a season ticket holder and your friends are season mm-hmm. ticket holder. But yeah, it might be slightly more difficult doing that, but. Yeah, I'd be pleased to see to see fans back in Ellen Road. I, I mean, I'm I'm no longer a season ticket holder, so it won't be me. So uh, I'll, I'll, <laughs> yeah. I'll I'll still be I'll be having to watch it from home. But yeah, it'd be it'd be nice to see you know some fans back in Ellen Road for the first first time since well, March. I was at the last game, um, at Huddersfield at home that we were in Ellen Road. So that was that feels like years ago now. It does, doesn't it? I mean, can you believe that March is in three months? I barely processed last March. <laughs> and March is again in three months. It's, yeah, it, it, it's really... It hits me even harder, mate, because my, my birthday's in March, so it feels like I've just skipped a year of my life. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it could be two years. <laughs> you know, you, you, you could miss your next birthday. Uh, hopefully, hopefully that doesn't happen, of course, fingers crossed. Um, but it, it will be interesting to see how the club you know, work out. Of course, 20,000 season ticket holders... And only, you know, if we are, if we are allowed fans back in, if we are placing tier two, only 2,000 in. So, you know, it, it would be every 10 games, uh, you know, a senior ticket holder can go. Um, you said, you know, it would be a balloting system. I think that's probably sensible. Although, 
you know, I've seen a lot of people say, you know, they'll probably just stick names in a hat and just pick out random people. But you know, what what if a five year old gets picked without their parent? The five year old to go by himself, you know, that that also, won't be the worst. So. Pulling names out of a hat, you're gonna have someone there pulling two thousand names out of a hat. He's gonna be there <laughs> forever. <laughs> yeah. And, yeah. And also, you'd have to you'd have to be on the str- if it was if they were doing it by like a stream. It's like the next person is, and you'd have to stay there for, while they pulled out two thousand bloody names. So if your name turned up, or whether they just post a list of names afterwards. Yeah, it will be the, interesting. I imagine they'll just they'll just yeah just spell it all out, work it all out, and then just email the people and say, "Oh look, you've got a ticket for this game. Here you go." And uh, yeah, you you can uh, you can go. But uh, no, it would be great to see these fans back at Ellen Road. Uh, soon and uh, yeah, scene ticket holders I'd imagine will get priority. Uh, I want a word on a uh, scene ticket holders actually. Uh, the club did announce that a uh, credit will be rolled over to next season. So if a fan makes it to five games, if scene ticket holder makes it to five games this season, then they only have to pay uh, the price of five games uh, to the new next season scenes ticket, which is a uh, which is quite good. That's a uh, quite a, a reasonable solution. A uh, quite good idea. Uh, speaking of Ellen Road, there have been some uh, developments. Uh, we've now got uh, two great big floodlights uh, outside the West Stand. Uh, part of the requirements when you're in the Premier League is to have good lighting. Uh, I didn't think the lighting was too bad beforehand. I mean, Patrick Bamford and Helder Costa were getting blinded by the lights last season, weren't they? So, uh, yeah, I don't, I don't know how they're going to do with these two ginormous pylons here. But um, now, Charles, what do you make of these uh, these floodlights? I'll be honest, mate. I couldn't tell the difference when I was watching the game. <laughs> I genuinely couldn't tell the difference. I mean, they look nice, and the the video of the club part was decent. But when I was watching the game, it didn't appear brighter than usual. Yeah, I, I, I couldn't tell. I couldn't tell any difference. Yeah, I I do think it's quite nice though that you know the the floodlights are diamond shaped. You know, just a little thing like that, very simple, but it's a you know it's a big nod to the to, you know to the history because you know there were two big floodlights there behind the West End at one point and they were diamond shaped so the fact that the club have made them diamond shaped here i think that's a really nice touch uh, really very simple but you know very uh, very effective yeah uh, now speaking of uh, redevelopment at uh, ellen road the uh, chief executive of leeds united angus Kinnear, has uh, stated recently uh, has been on the square ball podcast and uh, the uh, lufc trust uh, and he said that the club are currently looking at the first phase of redevelopment of the west and north stands uh, they're looking to expand the stadium to a capacity of around fifty-five to sixty thousand, uh, which is a uh, very exciting news. Yeah, it is. But you know, it seems like a little bit of a pipe dream at the moment, um, <laughs> because we'd have to stay in the Premier League to to justify spending that kind of money on expanding the stand. Um, obviously, he said that it's you know be three or, you know three or four years away. So it's a uh, it's nice having these kind of grandiose things, but. It feels like they've been talking about it for about eight months now, anyway, and nothing, yeah. nothing remotely happened yet. So, I think, and they, they've still got to change the um, the dugouts at Ellen Road, haven't they? To those kind of racing car type ones, you know, that the, the Premier League kind of prefers. So they've got there's a lot there's a lot of stuff that it's very much a you know on the to do list in a couple of years time kind of thing. I don't think it's gonna anything's gonna happen relatively soon. I think it's just a bit of you know, nice news to kind of get the fans on board. Um, yeah. Not that, not that I'm saying it's not true. It probably is true, but I yeah. think it's, you know, a way off yet. Mm. I mean, yeah, it definitely is a long process. Angus Kinney was saying that it's, you know, kind of a year just to plan it all out, or, you know, get, get you know, get, get the structure and plan it, plan it all out. And then, yeah, two, three years to, to build the whole thing. And uh, yeah, it won't, it won't be fully complete for, you know, three to four years if the were to start, you know, this year. So, um, yeah, it is a long project, but it's, it's an exciting one. You know, fifty-five to 60,000 uh, capacity at Ellen Road. You know, we, we've been needing it for, for quite a while, really. You know, 20,000 scenes ticket holders. You've got about 20 of, you know, 20 odd thousand on the waiting list as well for scenes tickets. So, um, yeah, uh, you know, big capacity at Ellen Road is definitely needed. And, um, yeah, it's good to, uh, uh, good to hear this. Uh, if we do eventually get to 60,000 fans capacity, will we sell that out, Charles? <laughs> Probably a stupid question. I'd like to think so. I think we will, but you know, we, we won't know until we've until <laughs> we start. I think we probably will, given the amount of demand there is for season tickets. And I think it'll depend on a number of factors, though: what league we're in, who's managing us, <laughs> what's going on. What, um, yeah, it, it will depend on a number of factors. Yeah, I, I'd, yeah. I'd, I'd, I'd like to think we. I'd like to think we would sell out, but yeah, I'm confident we would. 
Yeah. Sorry, yeah, that, was a, that, was a long, that was a that was a long way of saying that. I'm confident we would. <laughs> yeah, if we're still in the Premier League by the time you know the stadium gets expanded to that number, then uh, then yeah, and uh, yeah, Angus Skinner was saying that you know he wants Leeds United to be a top six club, and you know that's why he's aiming at sixty thousand fans. Uh, you know because that's you know that's stadium capacity of you know the top six clubs. So yeah, very interesting chat there. Definitely go and uh, listen to the Square Ball uh, or the LUC Trust. And listen to see what Angus Kinnear has been saying. Um, in other news, uh, five Leeds United games uh, in the new year have been selected for TV broadcasts. Surprise, surprise. Uh, Saturday, the 2nd of January 2021, uh, sees Tottenham take on Leeds United. That is a 12 30 kickoff, uh, now live on BT Sports. Uh, Leeds United versus Brighton on Saturday, the 16th of January, is a 3 pm kickoff live on Sky Sports. Uh, Leeds United versus Southampton on Wednesday, the 20th of January, is now a 6 pm kickoff live on Sky Sports. Uh, Leeds United's trip to Newcastle on Tuesday the 26th is now a 6pm kickoff on BT Sport. And uh, Leicester versus Leeds United on Sunday the 31st of January is a 2pm kickoff live on uh, Sky Sports. Uh, so yeah, uh, plenty of games uh, on uh, TV. And I, no, we missed all this when this was announced, but of course there was that pay-per-view thing. I'm, me and you were definitely against it. <laughs> um, uh, but the pay-per-view thing has been scrapped. And uh, yeah, every single game in the Premier League will be shown You know, on on TV for uh, for no extra charge, which is a uh, quite nice, quite uh, quite a good thing, really. Yeah, yeah, it's good. It, yeah. But you know, I don't have Sky or BT, so it's kind of irrelevant to me what what the platform is on. So um, until I yeah. until you, it's possible to go to pubs and watch games, it's it kind of makes no odds to me what what, what you know particular TV company is is is, is broadcasting the games. Um, but yeah, it's nice to have all that filthy TV revenue, and I will accept it gladly. Yeah, and it's nice to just have the whole pay per view thing scrapped. That whole pay per view thing making fans, you know, pay extra on top of you know subscriptions fees to Sky and BT. Yeah, it was just an absolute joke. So yeah, the fact that pay per view is no longer is a very good thing. And uh, yeah, fans who have already paying Sky Sports and BT Sports subscriptions, they can you know watch the games without without extra charge, which is uh, very good. Uh, well, moving on. Now, we of course all know how great Matt Elbielsa is, but he has recently been named as one of the three finalists for the FIFA's uh, 2020 Best Men's Coach Award. So Bielsa is essentially uh, one of the top three coaches in world football, which is just absolutely mind-blowing. <laughs> Yeah, it's a bit, it's a bit strange. The, the best bit about this is how, how much you know, rage this has caused in in opposition teams fans. And I don't think he'll actually win the award, but the the pure comedy value of if he did win the award would be far for me far better than winning the award itself. Just to just to see Chelsea fans and Aston Villa fans and you know all these other random fans booting off about it, it would be just brilliant. So I I, I hope we do win it. And I hope he also wins it for himself as well, because I think it'd be a, a nice thing for him. But you know, yeah. for me, I'm, I'm all just about the, the the amount of you know piss it's managed to boil and <laughs> up and down up and down this country of ours. I mean, the fact that it was hot that uh, he was nominated really angered opposition fans. But now that he's been named as one of the three finalists, he's essentially you know the top three coaches in world football. You know, it's um, yeah, very, very nice to see a lot of fans angry about it. And, uh, you know, I did not get their argument. People are saying, you know, Chris Wilder should be in there and Frank Lampard. Why? What have they done? Sheffield United have got one point in Premier League and bottom of the table. Frank Lampard took Chelsea. Uh, you know, they, they lost the Carabao Cup final last season. He took Chelsea, you know, top four finish. Uh, FA Cup final, yeah, sorry about that. Um, I mean, I can really care less about Chelsea and Frank Lampard and what they're doing. But uh, he, all I know is that he's done nothing <laughs> done absolutely nothing so you know they they should never be nominated for, for stuff like this he's, he's, he's managed Matt, to drag that poor underfunded club chelsea <laughs> up to the lofty heights of exactly where they finished the previous year <laughs> having only spent 600 billion pounds <laughs> yeah, well, to yeah fair, spend, to fair, depending on how they do this season he's obviously spent all the money in the last transfer window and people got about oh the poor transfer ban where they they they'd still signed like a fifty million pound midfield or whatever they signed just before it closed the ban was put in place, but I, I just feel mm-hmm. zero sympathy. Everything that Chelsea achieve is not due to the coaching ability of Frank Lampard. It is due to the <laughs> hundreds of millions of pounds worth of talent in that squad. My <laughs> nan could manage that Chelsea squad to fourth. <laughs> 
<laughs> okay. <laughs> I mean, it's hard, it's hard to dis- disagree with that. Um, <laughs> but no, they, you know, you know, managers like Chris Wilder, they don't deserve to be in. Marcel Bielsa has done an incredible job at Leeds. You know, he's taken a side that finished 13th in the Championship to play off semi-finalists for the following season, then to win in the Championship by 10 points and taking Leeds United back to the Premier League uh, 16 years uh, after a relegation. He's changed the whole ethos of the club and the city. Um, you know, Bielsa has done a fantastic job and, uh, yeah, definitely does deserve to have his, uh, his name uh, amongst some of the greatest coaches in, in world football, wouldn't you agree? Well, I would, yeah. Um, but I'm kind of biased because he kind of resurrected my club after, you know, my it, it being terrible my entire life. So I'm, I'm never going to be objective about him being a, you know, how <laughs> he's called as a coach. I'm, I'm always going to be subjective about it because he's, well, because of because of his impact on the club, but I, I, whether or not he's the best manager in the world is is up to people who spend more time looking at these type of things that I, than I do. He's he's certainly the the only manager I'd want managing Leeds, and that's all yeah. I really care about. Yeah, and on paper, Marcel Bielsa is the best manager uh, to have ever managed Leeds United as well. He's got the highest win percentage out of all our previous managers with fifty three point one percent. Played for one hundred thirteen games, one sixty drawn uh, 21 and lost 32. Uh, yeah, Bielsa's simply incredible. I, I just I just love him. I love him. I've never loved an old man so much. And I've never met Bielsa, like, personally. I've been in press conferences and stuff with him, but I've never, you know, sat down and spoken to him one of one. I've never met him, but I, I love him. I just love him. He, he's done a fantastic job with Leeds United. And, uh, yeah, definitely, uh, you know, definitely being nominated, you know, one of the top 10 best coaches in the world, definitely. But, uh, yeah, top, top three is quite surprising. But, um yeah, I, I do love it. And uh, yeah, we, it's surreal how we've gone from Paul Heggenbottom to one of the top three coaches in world football. It's just absolutely surreal. Um, speaking of Marcel Biel, so we are recording this after her, his uh, Newcastle press conference. And, and he has confirmed that there are no new injuries. Yes, get in. Uh, makes a lovely change, of course. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Uh, but of course, German international defender Robin Koch is still out. Unfortunately, he's going to be out for uh, three months uh, after undergoing a knee surgery. The 24-year-old uh, picked up an injury in the Chelsea game, of course, subbed off during that game. Um, but he has been struggling with it since uh, the Liverpool game at the very start of the season. Um, and yeah, Ch- Charles, don't you just hate it when you cocks out of action? <laughs> yeah, what a question. Um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, it is the... Ignoring the humorous side of it and taking your question seriously, it is frustrating to have him not, not in the squad. Um, yeah, in his interview, he was saying he's basically just been managing it since the Liverpool game. It's, it's been all right. He's been able to play through it, but obviously he got clattered in the Chelsea game and he, he couldn't continue. So it's the right idea to get in the surgery done quickly because you don't want to do what we did with Farshaw and just delay the surgery for ages and then cause more problems. You need to get done as soon as possible, get him back fit, and then we can start playing him again. Mm. Yeah, he's definitely going to be a a big loss, isn't he, Robin Clark? You know, we we spoke about him earlier. He's, he's a great defender, got better and better as the season's gone on. And uh, yeah, as, as we're saying, you know, he gives us the aerial presence at set pieces, which is, you know, a big problem for us. You know, that aerial presence is what we need. And uh, yeah, without Robin Clark, you know, he, he is going to be a very big loss, isn't he, Charles? He is, yeah. Um, and of course, 27 year old Spain international defender Diego Juventus is also still out. He won't return for another week or so. Uh, so who goes into centre-back for you? Do you stick with what we had uh, in that West Ham game or do, do you switch it up? Um, I know they're both left-footed, but I'd still go with Shurik and um, Cooper as a centre-half partnership. Um, but given I think we'll play a back three, I think it'll end up being Shurik, Cooper and uh, Phillips are in the back three. Mm. Unless he wants to play Ail in there. Which he'll probably end up playing Ailing in the back three with um, Phillips and Cooper, and then playing Stuart Dallas at right back. Um, yeah. I mean, <laughs> so, I feel as though Stuart was going there go in, uh, personally. Stuwick was really impressive at the start of the season. Don't you know? I don't think he's put a foot wrong really, Pascal Stuwick, in the Premier League this season, and I'd put him in. You know, with the fact that we're so poor um, aerially at set pieces, you know, we're poor at defending set pieces. Shubik is very tall, very big, uh, you know, around six six foot three or, or whatever. He, he's a very big man. He's, he's Pascal Shubik. And um, yeah, I'd put him in. I'd put him in defence. You know, I'd put Ailing back at right back, you know, which is his best position. Keep Liam Cooper in. I mean, 
Liam Cooper's kind of returned to returned back to League One Liam, hasn't he, over recent weeks, Charles? I wouldn't say that. I think that the whole defence has been poor. I won't pin it on one particular player. And I thought there, there was periods in the in the West Ham game where he, he was doing he was doing all right in open play. It was just obviously mm. in set pieces where the there was zero organisation. It was all falling apart, and obviously he was at fault for the second goal. But I thought from open play he was one of the probably one of the better defenders on the pitch. It's yeah. just defensively we're just shocking all round at the moment. I don't think you can pin it on one particular player. I think it's the whole the whole system at the moment. Yeah, yeah, I agree. But I, I do think Stuart going back in there, give it give us that aerial presence. I think was would be. You know, a, a pretty, a pretty good, a uh, pretty good uh, idea, really. Get Ailing back at right back, uh, Dallas back at left back. Get Alioski out of the team, and uh, yeah, Stewart and uh, and Cooper as the uh, defenders. And then if he is going going to go to a back three, then obviously Phillips can uh, can uh, slot back in there. But um, yeah, I, I definitely switch up. I definitely stick Stewart in just to give us that height. Um, but Weddon Levente, of course, featured in that uh, Chelsea game, came on for Robin Cock. Uh, what are your thoughts on him? Um. I wasn't hugely impressed with him in the Chelsea game in general. I know he got injured during the game, so I'm taking that into account. But I, I, I thought he, he, it was a lot of miscommunication between him and, and Meslier in, in that Chelsea game. I thought I thought he let the weight of the crowd get to him a bit, particularly um, with, with the irritating Chelsea fans, which I mean, there is no other type of Chelsea fan, but <laughs> there, there was a lot of them there. Um, yeah, I wasn't I wasn't overly impressed, but, you know, I'm willing to give players time to adapt to the system. He's only had one game and he's been injured for nearly the entire time he's been at the club. So I'm willing to give him a run of games before I make a proper judgment on it. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I didn't think Lamented did too bad, especially with those annoying Chelsea fans making all kinds of silly noises. Um, but yeah, definitely does need a bit more time. But when, when he is back fit, Lamente, does he go straight in for you? Um. Probably, just because I want a bit of stability in the back line. I want us to have a bit of a, you know, players playing in the regular positions. <laughs> if it means Zaylin can go back to right back and we can get our proper formation sorted, then yeah, absolutely. And I think he is experienced, which will help. So I think uh, I probably would, yeah. Well, let's now have a look at uh, Leeds United's next game, which sees them take on Newcastle United at Ellen Road on Wednesday night. It's a 6 p.m. kickoff live on Amazon Prime Video. So, uh, yeah, you're going to have to get Amazon Prime if you want to watch the game live. Uh, Charles, how are you feeling heading into this game? Concerned, <laughs> in a word. I'm concerned that we are not going to realise and adapt and react to the way we've been playing recently. And I'm concerned that a player as good, as good as Callum Wilson and a, a flair player like Sam Maximan is going to have the same impact that Ben Rama did where it just kind of runs through us. I think we need to be, have a bit more about us, a bit more grit and a bit more conviction. I think we need to get back a bit of that confidence we've of lost in recent weeks. Yeah. Yeah, I, I am quite worried as well heading into this. I mean, early on in the season, if we were playing Newcastle, I probably would have been quite confident. Um, but... Yeah, after recent recent weeks and recent results, yeah, I'm I'm not too, you know, I'm quite nervous heading into this really. And Newcastle, they have some very good players, you know, as you mentioned, Callum Wilson, uh, one of the best strikers in the division, in my opinion. Of course, Joe Linton as well, Almiron, Dwight Gale as well, just to name a few. They've still got Andy Carroll playing for him as well, which is uh, which is uh, insane. But um, you know, they've they've got decent height defense as well. Which just isn't too great for us, and the, yeah, the, 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 cells, the, the cells is an absolute, the cells is an absolute beast. He's a, yeah. he's a huge human. He's a he's a massive guy. So from from corners, he's going to be an issue. Uh, yeah. The 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 Dubravka in goal, he's a good he's a good goalkeeper. Um, I've, I've, I've been impressed with him whenever 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 I've seen him in recent years. Hmm. Um, Sam, I'm telling you, Sam Maximan's the one to watch. He's the he's their flair player. He's just he's the one that makes things happen. You watch him; he's he's a really skillful player. He might yeah. cause us issues, particularly down our down our left side. If he's out like injured, isn't he? Is he, he injured at the moment? Yeah, well, he wasn't featured in in the game uh, at the weekend. I don't know if it was suspension or whatever. But um... well, well it, it might it might just have been squad rotation, um, but he, he's a really good player. So yeah, yeah they, they do have a lot of. I mean, have they got their 
Are they, are they still playing Longstaff Brothers? Is uh, they, is it Sean yep. Longstaff still playing in the field? He, he's he's a decent player as well. So they've got a lot. Of, there's a lot of talent in that squad. Yeah, John Joe Shelby um, as well, very good midfielder. <laughs> and we all know all about John Joe Shelby. He had an absolute world class game for Blackpool a few years ago at Ellen Road. <laughs> Calvin Phillips against Lord Voldemort. <laughs> it's a hell of a, it'd be a hell of an evening. <laughs> yeah, he, that's the thing with Shelby. He's always been a really good, really good passer of the ball. He's got a great range. He's, he's actually a really good footballer. He just loses his head all the time and stamps on people, yeah. which is why he never. I think it's pretty much the only reason he's never made it in the England team is because of his tendency to stamp on people randomly. Um, <laughs> yeah, he's he's still a really good player. Yeah. Yeah, and Newcastle have, have some very good players, and of course a good manager as well. And Steve Bruce, very uh, experienced manager, and you know they, they're a well-equipped team. You know they, they're a well-established team. You know they, they know what they're doing. They know how to get results. Uh, you know Newcastle they've won the last two games: two 0 victory away at Palace and two one win over West Brom at home. Uh, they've played eleven this season, won five, drawn two, and lost four. Um, and yeah, they're, they're having a season that they were expecting. Really, the twelfth and seventeen points comfortably in mid-table. Um, so yeah, they're, they're you know they're a well-established team in Newcastle. You know, experienced manager and some very good players. But you know, Charles at the start of the season, you know, it was the teams like Newcastle. You're looking at and thinking these are the teams that we should be beating if we are wanting to stay up. Yeah, they're the kind of beatable teams. But then again, I said that about Palace and look how that look how that <laughs> kind of turned out. So that about West Ham, look how that kind of turned out. So I'm a lot to to kind of predict as to you know, turn up here, but this is the kind of game where you think this is a perfect, you know, stop the rock, get a win, mm. you know, get get back a bit of confidence type of game. You don't get many games where you think our team is probably, eat, well, the team, teams are, are far more even than they were against, you know, the likes of Chelsea and, and Man City and Liverpool, teams like that. The, 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 the squad's level of talent, they're fairly even. It's a, it's a, it's a winnable game, so I would love us to just turn up and get the three points. Yeah, I mean, we're definitely going to have to be on top of our game, though, if we are to, uh, to get anything here. But uh, yeah, Leeds, as I say, two defeats in a row, 14th from 14 points, just six points above the relegation zone. Would you say it's a must-win, Charles, on Wednesday? I don't, I don't want to say must-win at this stage of the season, but it it would be very helpful to win because I can't see us picking up anything that's that's scum. So we need to kind of get points where we where we can. I think it's a great opportunity to take some points. Yeah, you know the, the Newcastle game, as you say, is winnable. And yeah, if we are to stay up, these are the kind of teams that we need to be picking up points against. You know, because you know, although you know we've got a point against Man City and Arsenal this season. You know, and three points against Everton. You know, you're not you're not always going to get points. You know, we still have to play those teams again this season and not always going to pick up points against those kind of teams. You know, it's teams like Newcastle that you'd be picking up your points if you wanted to stay in the division. And uh, yeah, I feel as though this is a must win. Not not because I feel as though, you know, you know, six points above the relegation zone, I think we'll be fine you know, if, if we do end up losing this. But I, I just think just a boosting confidence. We, I think we all need just a morale boost. And I just say one win in six, you know, we, we just need a, a, a big confidence confidence boost and uh, you know win on Wednesday night under the full lights of Ellen Road against Newcastle yeah I, I think it just lift the mood a bit amongst everyone so uh, yeah I, I'd definitely say it's a must win yeah I, I don't agree with this a must win because I don't think that there's, there is any must wins in December unless you're Sheffield United on one point um, <laughs> but you know I think it's we do need to pick up some points so yeah. I think this will be a very good opportunity yeah uh, Leeds, though, have an awful record against Newcastle, but we did draw one all the way uh, there the last time we did face them. Uh, I game. <laughs> yeah, very good game. Uh, but what's the score going to be here for you? Do you think we can get the, get the three points? What's your, what's your score prediction here? I think we can. Uh, I think we're certainly able to. Uh, score prediction. This is tough. Optimistically, and I do mean optimistically, I'm going to go for a two. I'm going to go for a two-one victory. Yeah, I reckon we'll concede, but uh, yeah, I'm, I'm going to go be, with, with that score line as well. Two-one to Leeds United. Hopefully, Leeds United can pick up uh, the three points on Wednesday night. Well, that brings us to the end of episode eighty of the All Things Leeds podcast. Thank you very much, as always, to Charles for joining me. Thanks for having me on, Matt. 
And uh, thank you as well to everyone who has uh, watched or listened. We really do uh, appreciate uh, the support. Uh, if you did enjoy them, why not subscribe or follow on whatever pl uh, platform you are uh, currently uh, watching or listening uh, to us on. Uh, give us a five-star rating on uh, Apple uh, Podcasts if you're listening on there. Share the podcast around as well. It really does help us out. Um, and follow All Things Leeds on social media. We are on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Search up All Things Leeds 1 on Twitter and Instagram. Search up All Things Leeds on Facebook and uh, YouTube. Give us a subscribe to the YouTube channel. Uh, yeah, really do, really yeah, do uh, appreciate uh, the support. Uh, Charles and I will be back later on in the week to look ahead to that Manchester United game this weekend and look back on the Newcastle game, which, of course, we hope it is three points. So, uh, yeah, Charles and I will be back later on in the week. So, for now, take care, stay healthy, stay safe, and we'll see you soon. Bye-bye.